um, it was quite a dour um, end to the season on the final day, wasn't it? What did we have? We had Manchester City doing what they needed to do against West Ham. Highly professional performance as they'd done during the course of the week against Aston Villa. Um, yeah, I mean, hats off to the new Premier League champions, Manchester City, did what they needed to do. Uh, Chelsea didn't have too much to play for, uh, turned it around against uh, Cardiff, who had already been relegated. Uh, Liverpool really fluffed their lines in their last home game against Newcastle, uh, but eventually got there for the three points, and Arsenal um, beaten an already or virtually already beaten uh, and relegated Norwich City. So really, the, the really exciting stuff had done the week before, and certainly midweek, Sunderland staying up, etc, etc. Um, so no, it wasn't the drama of maybe two seasons ago when um, Aguero scored the last minute winner against QPR, but uh, City won't worry about the lack of drama. In fact, they'll probably be grateful there was none, and they take their second title in three years. experience of a couple of seasons ago. Um, they know, having won it on the final day a couple of years ago, how to get into those last couple of games and see it through. But I'd like to pay tribute to the manager, Manuel Pellegrini. He came here with a decent rep, uh, certainly with all those that love their football, but there was this thing, he's never won anything. He's been at some really big clubs, including Real Madrid. He's now won something, and I think the thing that he's done, unlike the Roberto Mancini reign at Man City, when obviously they won a league title as well and an FA Cup, from what I can recall, you didn't have these constant movies about you know, teaching the ranks, fallout between players and players and players and players. What he's done is essentially got the same players, he's given them a common influence, he's made some major decisions and survived them. Joe Hart getting dropped for a couple of months at the start of the season, then welcoming him back into the fold. And Joe Hart has been absolutely blinded for Man City towards the end of the season. Um, bringing on the careers of Edin Dzeko, who was a bit of a reserve under Mancini for the want of a better term and scores 15, 16 goals. And didn't he score vital and important goals away to Everton, away to Palace? All of those were difficult games, but City saw it through, I think, due to experience and a manager that formed a calm and influence. And he had a real template as far as I was concerned. He wanted to, if you like, be a really high, high, high class Newcastle. We're going to score as many goals as possible and concede as little as we can. And I think they did that right until the end. The penultimate game of the season they beat, um, was it Villa 4-0? They were patient, they didn't get a goal for about 60 minutes and then scored three or four in the last half an hour or so. so got the job done against West Ham, fantastic. And you know, listen, they're the richest probably sports club in the world right now, certainly football-wise. If he goes on, Pellegrini that is, and spends the money wisely that they obviously have, um, without counting too many chickens and making too many predictions and in sport it can always go wrong sometimes, uh, Manchester City could be here to stay. The biggest surprise of that England squad is Ashley Cole's not going. Listen, 107 caps, all the experience in the world. Listen, uh, Leighton Baines, who I'd imagine will start, and uh, Luke Shaw, the, the wonder kid at Southampton, um, are they defenders? Um, and then not only that, you look along the back line, you know, there's no Rio Ferdinand, there's no John Terry. And I know, you know, sport has got to move on, but we're probably going to have John, uh, Glenn Johnson of Liverpool, who's had a really good season at his club. Um, I just look at England's back four, and I think there are lots of weaknesses there. And in the rarefied heat of Brazil, uh, swell in temperatures, I think England can once again get found out. Uh, Ashley, Ashley Cole's a, a major surprise to me. I'm surprised that Frank Lampard's going, <laughs> if I might add that as well. I thought he'd run his, run his race. Outside of that, I like what Roy's trying to do um, in terms of uh, the young talent that is available. Ross Barkley, uh, Raheem Sterling, who's been wonderful for um, Liverpool during the course of the season. So what I see, what he's trying to do, I just think that back line, I think if you're trying to experiment with young players, I think you need to look at midfield and forward line. I just think maybe defensively, you just need a little bit of solidity, a little bit of nous and a little bit of savvy, that when things are going wrong, things can be slowed down. And uh, I don't see that in the back line, which I think will be Johnson, Jagger Yelka, Cahill, who's had a great season at Chelsea and Leighton Baines. Leighton Baines will give me a good free kick and maybe lots of assists as he's done over his career at Everton, but I'm not sure up against the very, very best players in the world uh, if he's up to it, but we'll find that in the next couple of months or so.
It's difficult because only come England being knocked out or winning the World Cup will you be able to decide whether that's been a bold decision. I just think that even with limited appearances for Chelsea, you saw the, the boys' class. You don't get 107 caps um, if you're not a good player. And I think he showed towards the end of the season that he still had some, some uh, fuel in the tank, um, whether that be at Chelsea as we move forward. Um, only time will tell, but I certainly think he had something to offer in terms of England. And as I said, the back line that looks like it will start against uh, Italy in the World Cup come middle of June doesn't fill me with the greatest uh, sense of confidence. And I think someone like Ashley Cole, who's been there, done a T-shirt video, World Cups, European Championships, and clearly not ready for the knackers yard just yet. I just think he would have brought something that we could have relied upon, as we have done over the years. So um, time will tell. Best manager, listen, it's easy to give it to those that win the trophies, that's what football's all about. But I'm going to give a shared award for the best manager, I'm going to give it to Gus Poirier. One, because his team were bottom at Christmas and traditionally you go down if that's the case. But he has got his team on two really good cup runs, got to the Capital One final and for 45 minutes played Man City off the park or certainly matched them. Uh, had a good run in the FA Cup as well. And what I loved about what Gus Poirier has done is that he had his team from day one the Lee Catamoles, the Barinis, uh, the Jack Colbecks, he's got them playing football and it worked. Brave decision, at no stage did he change his principles and it worked for them, happy for him. And my other manager of the year on a shared level would have been Tony Pulis. Listen, I wasn't the greatest admirer of Tony Pulis at Stoke. I thought, uh, you know, the ball was more up in the air than it was on the grass, but he's got to Crystal Palace who what, had four points when he started and when he came, I think around November time, once again, you know, uh, Yannick Balassi, Jason Punch and Cameron Jerome. I was privileged, and I use the word privileged seriously, because I saw Palace come to uh, West Ham towards the end of the season and play really, really good, attractive football and deservedly win that game. If he can build on that, I think Crystal Palace could go the way of the Stoke without the long ball um, and, and the harsh tackling. I think that uh, if he can get his chairman to invest uh, at Palace, Palace could uh, sometime soon be an established Premier League club. And don't forget, Palace, if you check their Premier League record, no sooner than they get promotion do they get relegated back to the Championship. Tony Pulis has put an end to that run, so he'd get my award for that as well. My team of the season, I think it has to go to Manchester City. Um, listen, there was a spell. Up you know, I think they beat Norwich by seven at the Etihad. I think Arsenal got spanked by six. I think Tottenham got spanked by six or by five. They were scoring goals for fun. And yes, they went through a bit of a blip, but at the end of the season, as they started it, by scoring goals for fun, they're the genuine entertainers. I looked at them on the final day of the season. I looked at them a little bit like I looked at Arsenal's Invincibles in the early 2000s. Big men, experienced players, technically gifted, and they were together as well. So uh, yeah, team of the season for me is Manchester City. My player of the season um, would be Yaya Torre um, because I think we've looked at the great career of Frank Lampard at Chelsea and we've looked at the goals he scored over a consistent basis, might I add, um, from midfield. And, you know, while he might have a few more seasons to deliver, Yaya Torre scored 20 goals for Manchester City. And I think the goal against Villa in the penultimate game for City said it all. He ran from inside his own area or his, his own half and the, my magic memory of that goal would not be the goal itself, he had the composure to tuck it away beautifully, but you had six Aston Villa players chasing him, none of them were slouches, um, most of them were physically um, adept, but they were shrugged off by Yaya Toure. Um, he's been a wonderful purchase for City, I think he's pivotal, he's as pivotal to, to City as Aguero is, as David Silver is, as Joe Hart is and uh, Vincent Company, the captain. So my prayer of the season is Yaya Torre and uh, I'll be following him with the Ivory Coast during the course of the World Cup. <laughs>